Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz coming to you from Los Angeles. And here's some of the stories we're following tonight. One year has passed since Russia first invaded Ukraine, and as world leaders try to mark today in ceremonies, the hard reality is that intense fighting continues as we speak, with no end in sight. Accused murderer Alec Murdoch is back on the witness stand today, back to denying he killed his family, and back to admitting to telling lies. I told a lie about being down there, and I got myself wed to that. Mother Nature has parts of California looking like Antarctica as this coast-to-coast -coast winter storm is living up to its name. And renowned physicist and author Michio Kaku joins us to talk about these jaw-dropping pictures that challenge just about everything we know about the universe. And we're going to examine how one woman might just upend the entire world of ballet. I don't think there's um, anything wrong with telling stories uh, about men and women, as long as we're also telling stories about people who don't identify as men and women. So I, I think there's room for everybody. Tonight, the world continues to mark one year since Russia invaded Ukraine, and all around the globe, tributes have been pouring in from other countries. But for the Ukrainian people, anniversary is the wrong choice of word. This is a fight for their lives. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky held a press conference earlier to mark the occasion and said, as he has many times before, that Ukraine will win this war. If we'll fulfill our tasks, then we'll definitely have this victory. I'm confident that we'll have this victory. So, and uh, I hope this will happen this year. Zelensky also met with G7 leaders virtually, who, along with the U.S., announced new sanctions against Russia today, which include hundreds of sanctions and restrictions on Russian exports and increase in tariffs on Russian products. The U.S. also announced a new $2 billion aid package for Ukraine with high-tech military equipment and ammunition, along with more financial aid. And all of this comes as Russia continues to pound Ukraine, showing no signs of slowing down. Over the course of the last year, tens of thousands of lives have been lost. 100,000 Russians and 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed, along with more than 7,000 civilians, including 400 children. And according to the U.N., nearly 8 million Ukrainians have fled the country to neighboring Poland and Romania. Europe has not seen this kind of land conflict since World War II. It's been a long year for Ukrainians. And I want to take you back to the very moment Ukraine came under attack, the moment it all changed exactly one year ago, the moment the first air raid sirens went off in Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. Take a look. Trying to keep people uh, calm, trying to keep people from panicking in what is... And there, there we go. Ali, I've just heard uh, the first siren has just gone off. Uh, and I've been told by city officials that that indicates that this is a city under attack. That, again, is the first time we have heard sirens in the capital, Kyiv. MSNBC anchor Ali Velshi joins me now from Kyiv. Uh, Ali, I, I remember your reporting so vividly from when all of this started. You were the, one of the first anchors on the ground in Ukraine. Can you take us back uh, to what the mood was like then, the fear, and what it's like now a year later? I'm standing in, uh, Gotti, exactly the same space that uh, Aaron McLaughlin was in the night that happened. And the difference was, I mean, I, you can't see it in this shot, but I can see a bridge over there, and that's where the Russian tanks were. Uh, Ukrainians on that night literally feared that their capital was going to be taken and their country was going to be overrun. This was real legitimate fear. One year later, we are looking at the suburbs of uh, Kyiv that were occupied by the Russians until about April 1st of 2020. Uh, the Ukrainians took those places back. Now, what they discovered when they took it back is that war crimes had been committed. People had been massacred, their bodies lying in the street for weeks. But the Ukrainians did take that back. You look at places in the south like Kherson, uh, 
actually taken by the Russians, a government installed by the Russians, and they were pushed out of Kherson. You look at Odessa, which was going to be taken from three sides, two sides on land and one side by the sea. They never got there from the east. They never got the Russians, never got there from the west, and they were going to fire on Odessa from the Black Sea fleet. But the Ukrainians took out their flagship, the Moskva. So what the difference tonight is this is still a city that comes under attack. Within the last uh, 13 or 14 hours, we had an air raid siren today. But it, they are not living in existential fear that their country will disappear because of the, the, the support that they've gotten from America and the West. And Joe Biden showing up here on Monday was that little extra push they needed when America said, we're not leaving you. Um, there's, a, there's a new spring in the step of uh, Ukrainians. Still, they've lost many, many soldiers, many, many civilians. These are still cities that face missile attacks on a regular basis in the east part of the country. There are It's trench warfare. It looks like World War I or World War II. It's still very much a war, but there is a sense that Ukrainians maybe could be, with continued assistance from NATO, get the upper hand in this one. And Ali, a, us a world away from where you are right now, so many of us were watching that press conference today with Zelensky uh, as he was talking about where things stand. I, I believe I heard you ask a question. Uh, what, was, what was discussed and, and what did you ask? Well, one of the things that Volodymyr Zelensky said is that this is the year Ukraine will win that war. The, 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 there is some concern, though, that if they don't, uh, what does that mean? What happens next? Uh, the Polish president had said something about, you know, Russia will look into going into other countries. So that's what I asked President Zelensky. Given how effectively you have uh, held back a Russian advance with NATO's help here in Ukraine, is it even conceivable that, that Russia could invade another state, particularly a NATO state? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, I believe it's possible. And that might happen. And the president gave me a fairly long answer in which he said, at some point, Vladimir Putin's got to have something to show for all the effort he's put in. And if he realizes that it's not going to be Ukraine, it might be somewhere else. He feels that Europe still needs to realize that Ukraine is standing between Russia and invasion of other parts of Europe. Uh, and that's why everybody has to be continued, uh, has, to, has to stay on a, at a continued level of vigilance, Scotty. Ali, I, I got to ask you a question. I remember leading up to this, so many of us were wondering, is this really going to happen? Is this really going to happen? And then it did. And now we have the question that you just asked. Could we see a NATO ally also invaded or, or possibly attacked? And I feel kind of the similar feeling that we did a year ago. Could that happen? Uh, how do right. you see that? Do you see that as something that's likely or, or is this something that that is uh, pretty far off the table? Well, if you're Poland or the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, these countries are very, uh, they have a very aggressive footing. They're the, they're the sort of the tip of the spear for NATO. They're the ones that want NATO to respond even more strongly. It's Poland who said, let's give them jets. It's Poland who first said, let's give them tanks. Um, so on those countries are very aggressive because they don't want any more Russian aggression. They're, they're neighbors to Russia. Where this would likely go, though, if, if Vladimir Putin wanted to go somewhere else instead of Ukraine, is it might be Moldova. Uh, it might be weaker uh, NATO states. It's, it doesn't seem conceivable that it could happen, but to a lot of people, Gadi, it wasn't conceivable that they would try and overtake Ukraine, and they did. So the, the question is, where is Vladimir Putin in his mission to create the great um, Russian land again, in his, in his vision to be the new Peter the Great? His, his ambitions don't seem to have dipped even though his success has not been what he hoped it to be. So it, it, yet to see how this plays. You know, Joe Biden said something uh, in two, on Tuesday in Poland. He says, when Russia decides to stop fighting this war, this war will end. When Ukraine decides to stop fighting this war, Ukraine will end. And that's kind of the story. Uh, something that's stuck with so many of us watching from here. Uh, last question, Ali, if you don't mind. You've been covering this in depth for a year now. Is there a moment that sticks out to you? Is there a moment for you that, that you continue to think about or, or defines this conflict so far? It was something else. We were sitting in that press conference with President Zelensky, and, um, and, and somebody asked him, what was the worst day of the war? And I, when he answered the question, I, 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 my eyes bugged out because I always say the same thing. It was April 2nd, 2022. It was the, the, the morning after the night we found out 
what happened in Bucha. The, uh, the Ukrainians had liberated Bucha and the images had come out. And I, I mean, I, I don't, in my reporting experience, I've never seen anything like it. The dead bodies that had been lying in the street for weeks, the cars that had been lying there where they had shot people, uh, a young boy's body uh, in a car. That's the moment that this went from feeling like a war that is an abstraction, a war fought between armies into something entirely different. And I think it had that effect on everybody who saw it that day. There's been a lot of terrible stuff that has happened in this country over the last year. And by the way, some of it we may not know about for a long time in places like Mariupol, where uh, we still don't have access. But that day where we discovered what happened in, in Bucha, April 2nd, uh, 2022, had always been the day that I most think about as having had the greatest effect on me. And I learned today it's the, the same day that, uh, that, that President Zelensky thinks about and probably the same day that, that many Ukrainians think about. And like you said, those are just the things that we know about. There are so many other things happening uh, right. as we speak. Ali Velshi, thanks so much. And with us now, also from Kiev, is former ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst. Ambassador Herbst, so far, the United States, we've seen them commit $72 billion in aid to Ukraine, including high-tech military equipment. The rest of the world is pitched in about $80 billion in aid. Uh, how much of an impact has that had? Well, there's no question if we had not sent the assistance and if our allies and partners had not sent the assistance, um, Ukraine would be in much worse shape. I think they might still be in this fight, but they'd have maybe half the territory they currently control today, and they'd be in great danger. And Ambassador, the U.S. seems to be trying to stay away from the topic of F-16 fighters. Uh, why is that? We've been supplying ammo, rockets, rocket launchers. It seems like that's a, a fuzzy line in the sand. If you look carefully at American policy since the, this big invasion a year ago, you see consistently Ukraine asked for weapon systems in the United States out of undue caution, even timidity, has said no. And then over time, as we see Russian savagery, as the administration is, is criticized for that caution, they change their mind. And that's what's happened. That's what happened with the HIMARS back last last March and April. They only, we only decided to send them at the end of May. That happened with the, with the tanks, which are now being sent. That happened with the Patriot anti-air anti defense systems. It's happening now with F-16s, and more importantly, with longer-range missiles, longer-range fires, such as ATACMS, which could go 300 kilometers. So do you see a future in which the United States may supply F-16s to Ukraine? I'd be willing to wager a good bit that we'll send the F-16s. I just hope it's next week, as opposed to a year and a half from now. Ukraine needs and it. And Ambassador, the... I'm sorry, please go ahead. Uh, if if that happens, we've heard a lot of saber rattling from Russia. Do you think Russia uh, sees that as a line in the sand, or is this just another line that they have drawn since the beginning? The Russians have drawn five or six lines in the sand threatening nuclear use, and each one has been passed without anything happening. It would be suicide for Russia to, well, actually, it would be senseless for Russia to use tactical nukes in Ukraine. That would not affect the battle. To use more than tactical nukes would be suicide. So I think the chance of them using nukes possible, but highly unlikely. And in terms of what comes next, in the next year, where do you see the conflict heading? Um, if we give Ukraine the things we are currently refusing to give them, the longer range fires, like the Attackums, the F-16s, if we gave those things, and more tanks, more tanks, these things, say, by the summertime, you would see a highly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive in the south, perhaps even breaking the line of contact, the land bridge, from Russia through Donbass to Crimea. That would be a huge military victory for Ukraine. Forcing Russian force, forcing Russian troops to go to retreat into Crimea, and giving a huge logistical problem to Putin to supply those forces. It would also be a political; it would have political in, impact in Russia. Even without that, we will see a Ukrainian counteroffensive this year that will make some progress, but it won't make nearly as much. The war will last longer, and there will be far more Ukrainian casualties. And I think so many people are looking to see what happens with those F-16s coming up next. Ambassador, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.
In South Carolina, they're calling what we are seeing play out in a courthouse there the trial of the century. As one of the state's once powerful lawyers has been put on the stand accused of killing his wife and son. The former attorney admitting to lying about everything from money to drugs to hiring someone to kill him, but insisting he did not kill his family. The prosecution pulled no punches when attacking his credibility. Everything about me not going to the kennel was a lie. And you're able to just do that just so easily and so convincingly and so naturally, don't you? I mean, that's not for me to judge. That's true. Now, the prosecutor focused on Alec Murdoch's admitted web of lies, then put a spotlight on what the jury must decide. Mr. Murdoch, are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. I would never hurt Maggie Murdoch. I would never hurt Paul Murdoch under any circumstances. And once the prosecution was done, the defense focused on Murdoch's addiction, trying to blame the lies on his drug problems. Here's NBC News' correspondent Katie Beck outside the courthouse. More riveting testimony for the second day in a row from Alec Murdoch taking the stand in his own defense. Prosecutors coming today on cross-examination with the hard questions, hitting at the heart of the case and questioning why Murdoch lied to investigators about his whereabouts on the nights of the murder, why he lied about being at the kennel, and grilling Murdoch about some steps he was taking as he returned home from the kennels. They referenced data that show he was taking 70 steps a minute for a period of time before leaving to go to his mother's house. Murdoch on the stand looked unsteady, having trouble answering that question. And that's far more steps in a shorter time period than, than any time prior, as you've seen from the testimony in this case. So what, what were you so busy doing? That's going to the bathroom? No, I don't, I don't think that I Did you get on a treadmill? went to the bathroom. No, I didn't get on a treadmill. Jogging place? No, I didn't jog didn't in jump place. Jacks? No, sir, I did not do jumping jacks. What were you doing, Mr. Murdoch, for those four months? Preparing to leave for my mom's house. What? What does that mean? We expect several more witnesses to testify on Monday and Tuesday ahead of closing arguments. This could mean the case will be in the hands of the jury by the end of next week. Back to you. NBC's Katie Beck, thanks so much. And let's break all this down with NBC News legal analyst Joyce Vance. She's also a former U.S. attorney. Uh, Mr. Murdoch said, sorry for stealing money. Then he said this about his alleged victims. Take a listen. Every single client, I looked them in the eye, and I believe that the people that I stole money from for all those years trusted me. Now, Joyce, the jury isn't here for financial crimes. They're, they're here for the murders. So what do you make of the prosecution taking Mr. Murdoch down this whole lane here? Well, the prosecution needs to establish that Murdoch is a skilled liar, that he's lied to people he loved, lied to people who trusted him. And I expect we'll hear the prosecution in closing argument tell the members of the jury that he lied to them, too, and that they should not believe his self-serving testimony. And Joyce, you heard him earlier asking Murdoch if he's a family annihilator. Uh, now, here's some more sound. For the first time in your life of privilege and prominence and wealth, when you were facing accountability, each time suddenly you became a victim and everyone ran to your aid. Isn't that true? I, I mean, I disagree with that, but... And he, you, you, what's your shame for you is an extraordinary provocation. Isn't that true, Mr. Murdoch? So this seems like a, a different day in terms of how prosecution uh, went up against uh, Mr. Murdoch. How do you think they did? Well, they had Murdoch on the stand for about 10 hours, uh, split between his own testimony and, and then the cross-examination. And the problem that the prosecution faces here is this. In order to convict, they have to have a unanimous jury. Murdoch only has to convince one juror to have some form of doubt, a serious doubt, a reasonable doubt, 
and refused to vote to convict in order to hang the jury and at least live to fight these charges another day. So as a skilled lawyer, he is very likely focused in on one or two members of the jury who he thinks might find his story relatable. And that's his entire goal, to inject some reasonable doubt, to say he loved his wife and loved his son and hope that his problems, his problems with pills, his problems and this entire story that he has um, now told about lying because he was frightened of the police, hoping that that will resonate with one or more of these jurors. If you were prosecuting this case, would you have liked to cross-examine him up on the stand? You always, as a prosecutor, want to cross-examine your defendant on the witness stand. That's one of the reasons that very few defendants end up taking the witness stand. It's dangerous. It can expose the weaknesses in your story. And that's what we saw here. You know, the prosecution is biding its time in cross-examination. It's not the moment where they argue inconsistencies to the jury. They ask the questions and they draw the inconsistencies out. And when the prosecution makes its closing argument, they'll take all of these little moments that they've mined from Murdoch's testimony. And I suspect we'll see them put together a timeline showing every place he lied and why it makes his defense incredible, giving the jury that proof beyond reasonable doubt that they need to convict. It's going to be a long list. Joyce Vance, thanks so much. Thanks. And still to come, snow in Southern California. That's right, there is currently a blizzard warning in effect in some areas. If you don't believe me, here is some proof. It snowed in Hollywood and I made a snowball. And the proof is the Hollywood sign in the back, in the background. <laughs> this is crazy, crazy weather we're having. And welcome back. I'm Gotti Schwartz, joining you from Los Angeles, where there were a whole bunch of people trying to find their umbrellas and rain jackets earlier today. Uh, right now, intense rain has more than 10 million people under flood watches from here all the way up to Santa Barbara. And it's not just rain. We've also got an actual blizzard warning for the mountains above L.A., Ventura, and San Bernardino. Up near the Hollywood sign, a little bit of snow, while even higher up at Big Bear Mountain, which you can see here, it's looking a lot more like Alaska. And up north, the Napa Valley vineyards, normally warm and sunny, they are covered in snow as well. Some people taking it in stride. You can see a vineyard owner there snowboarding all the way down past those grapes. Uh, on top of all that, millions are also under wind alerts across the west with the possibility of wind gusts of up to 75 miles an hour up in the mountains. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffith joins us now. Uh, my drive to work was pretty hellish, Dana. I live like a mile away from the bureau here. We've already seen a bunch of crashes. Uh, you've been out and about in that, might I add, amazing down jacket that is also somehow uh, waterproof. <laughs> oh, what, are you, what are you seeing out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got it. The, the coat is definitely doing its job because not only is it wet, it is cold. You know, I'm seeing things across the state that I have never seen before. I just moved to L.A. from San Diego and they actually had a blizzard warning today, the first in history. And this type of weather is very rare. Up in the mountain, there's a, in, in the mountains, there have been whiteout conditions. We've seen spin out. Some highways had to be closed because it's just not safe. And Gotti, here in Los Angeles, it has been raining nonstop. Yeah, I can hear it. And I, it, it almost sounds like I can hear, I know where you're at. You're close by and you've got the LA River over to your right. It almost sounds like you can hear it. I know Los Angeles is under a flood watch right now. Do you think we're prepared? And it looks like a lot more rain is on the way. So could it get a lot worse? Yeah, you know, Gotti, it could. Flooding will be a major concern even as the storm moves out of the region because we're just getting so much of it in a short period of time. And the snow melt could add to that flooding issue. As far as being prepared, you know, it's hard to say. Some were because they decided to work from home. I even had a friend who told me that her job sent her home early yesterday so that they could prepare for this rain. Others clearly were not. We just showed you part of that video there. We have images of submerged cars along Interstate 5 in Los Angeles, one guy actually had to climb on top of his vehicle and wait for help. And local officials have been advising people to avoid the roads unless you absolutely have to drive. And you mentioned the L.A. River, Gotti, which is to the right of me. Uh, we've got this kind of river corridor right behind our building that is usually bone dry. 
And this happens a lot of times when we get rain like this, the LA River just starts rushing through and it's a deluge. It's, it's just incredible to see this here in Los Angeles County. Gotti. Yeah, whitewater rapids. Yeah, and I'll be yeah. I'll be coming to find you. I want to I want to know exactly where that coat is from and where I can get one of those. Dana, I'll give you the so secret. I, I'll leave it at my desk for you in case you may need this as you leave the office. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks so much. <laughs> but it's not just California getting blasted. In Michigan, an intense ice storm is leaving over 600,000 people without power right now. The electric company is saying some people could be without power till Sunday. NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns joins us now. Bill, most of the U.S. is experiencing some sort of extreme weather. How much more is on the way? Uh, flash flooding. I mean, that's my number one concern through the evening. I mean, up to this point, and especially California, we've been watching all these pictures of the snow on the mountains. I remember I told you, Gotti, I said, by the time the storm's over, almost every city in California will be able to see snow in the distance on some of the mountains. And that's come true. Even San Diego, L.A., uh, all the way back up to San Francisco. But the concern tonight is this heavy rainfall into Southern California. The two don't mix. I mean, it never does. You know, and especially as we're going throughout this period where we've had a lot of rain that during the day today. Now it's pouring this evening again. And the way this trajectory is coming up from the south, it's just ringing out right over the mountains north of L.A. And because of this, we have flash flood warnings for almost the entire region for like the next six hours. We're concerned with many possibilities. First off is you get the flooding on the underpasses, the highways, the urban street flooding. And then outside of the urban areas, we have a big potential for landslides, mudslides, uh, debris flows on burn scar areas all through this region. So these flash flood warnings include the Los Angeles area all the way to Santa Barbara. And this is happening now. And unfortunately, when we see the pictures in the morning, it may be ugly. We've already had one to three inches of rain, and we're expecting another two to five. So you take eight inches of rain anywhere in this country, and it's a problem. You put it in the mountains outside of L.A., and that just, you know, multiplies. So as far as the rainfall totals, additional two to three to four on top of everything that we've already had. So that's the number one concern. And, of course, we've already got a report of 30 inches of snow in the last 24 hours at Mammoth. So the higher elevations are just getting nailed by the snow. But you kind of expected that. And we're not seeing the low elevation snow anymore like we did early this morning. And we still have those blizzard warnings. It's amazing. We have a blizzard warning up against a flash flood warning just outside of Los Angeles. It's almost something you never see. But, you know, in the, within 10 miles, you're either in a blizzard warning or a flash flood warning. So what happens this weekend? So on Saturday, it's not quite as bad, but we're still going to see some snow windy conditions and rain. Then on Sunday, we take that California storm and we bring it out into the plains. This storm isn't done yet. It is a chance of some severe weather, maybe even an isolated tornado or two, areas of Oklahoma and Texas into Kansas. We'll watch that. And then the final stop for this storm, and heads up to all my friends in New England, this looks like a snowstorm for central and northern New England. Looks like an icy mess from New York City northwards to Hartford to Boston. This is going to be trouble Tuesday morning, Gotti, for a lot of people's morning commute. Uh, Bill, I mean, just watching those maps, a, a lot of people in L.A., we are wondering if this is a, a La Nina turning into an El Nino thing or is this something totally out of the norm? I mean, you just you see you see what you put up there and you're trying to make sense of this. You're trying to find the pattern in this. Is there a pattern at all? Well, La Nina's typically, we take the storms up to the Pacific Northwest, and we kind of have a dry. This is our third La Nina winter in a row, and we know what happened the last two. It was very dry in California. It just made the drought even worse. And so this has been mm -hmm. a change. La Nina is weakening, and we're probably heading towards an El Nino this upcoming summer. So, again, it is a kind of a pattern switch. This has not been a really strong La Nina signature throughout the region. So, you know, it has been an exception. It's not really what we expected going into the winter, Gotti. Um, you know, typically we get drought and fire danger during La Nina's, and we have anything but that going on right now. I, I mean, is it, the, the last question, like, is this the end of the winter? Is this the last big hurrah, or are we going to be seeing this in the next couple of weeks, next month, uh, maybe next two months? Uh, if you're talking across the country, a lot of people are not going to like March. February was really warm. Um, we could have three snowstorms in the northeast in the next seven days. And then after that, it looks like much of the country is going to have a very chilly middle of March. So, uh, yeah, don't put away the winter gear yet. Thanks. You heard it here first, Bill. Thanks so much. 
And after the break, six new galaxies. That's what astronomers just discovered and why it's got astrophysicists everywhere like, wait, how big did they say they were? We've got the legendary Michio Kaku with us to help make sense of it all. Plus, more than 40,000 fish and animals died after a train carrying toxic chemicals derailed in Ohio. It's left people wondering how safe could it possibly be for them? And speaking of trains, a freight train slammed into a tractor trailer that was stuck on the tracks in Haverstraw, New York. Luckily, the driver of the truck was able to get out in time. The train crew is also all right. We're going to be right back. And it's time now for some of the big headlines we're watching tonight. The University of Idaho says the house where four students were killed in November will be torn down. The school's president calls the decision a, quote, healing step. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, who was in charge of weapons on the set of the Alec Baldwin Rust movie, is pleading not guilty to involuntary manslaughter. This is her first court appearance since the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. The judge did allow Gutierrez-Reed to keep a gun at home for self-defense. Her lawyer says she's received threats and had to file a restraining order because of a stalker. In Philadelphia, at least seven people were shot last night, including a two-year-old girl. It happened near an elementary school, and police are still looking for suspects. Officials say all seven victims were taken to the hospital and are currently in stable condition. The kitchen brand Kasori is recalling nearly two million of their air fryers. This comes after hundreds of people report that the machines caught fire. We're specifically talking about air fryers that were sold in U.S., Mexico, or Canada between 2018 and 2022. The Consumer Product Safety Commission says to stop using them immediately. And remember that viral moment from last year's Oscars? Yeah, the one where Will Smith straight up slaps Chris Rock on stage. Well, the Academy is launching a crisis team for the 2023 Oscars, which are happening in just a matter of weeks. And the idea behind the new team is to be ready for any possible real-time emergencies. And out of the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, today we are learning that there may have been more than 43,000 fish and aquatic creatures that died because of the toxic disaster. Officials say most of them were minnows, about 38,000 of them, and more than 5,000 other species were killed within a five-mile span of the impacted area. Meanwhile, there are still some people in East Palestine that have had to stay away from their homes now for three weeks. NBC's Ron Allen spoke with one of them. I live out of my car and at my daughter's house. It's awful. I feel homeless. Why won't you come back home? Because I, I, I don't know what I'm coming home to, and I'm 70 years old. What would make you comfortable enough to come back home? I think I need to see some data. Data of the dirt, data of the water, data of the air. And here's Ron Allen with more from East Palestine. It's three weeks later, and some of the attention here is starting to die down. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation came and went yesterday. The EPA chief has come a couple times. Even Donald Trump has been here and gone. And now residents are concerned about whether this place will be forgotten. That's been the, a concern all along. It's a small rural community, and they worry that the rail company, the wealthy big rail company, Norfolk Southern, is going to essentially leave, steamroll them, and, and leave them with this uh, contaminated mess, soil, at the crash site, and air and water that many residents still are not trusting, still feel is, is bad, even though there have been constant testing and, uh, by the EPA and others uh, saying that the environment is safe. Also now, everyone is digesting this report by the National Transportation Safety Board about the causes of the crash. They point to a wheel bearing overheating. Uh, the, the crew stops the train when an alarm goes off. Uh, the train had been, over, the bearing had been overheating for some 20 miles or so. The crew did nothing wrong according to the NTSB. The question is why did that happen? What, what caused that mechanical problem? Um, so that investigation goes on. Meanwhile, there are a growing number of residents who were suing the rail company um, because of this accident, claiming that they were damaged, that they should be paid compensation, that they want they want medical monitoring and screening indefinitely going forward. So that's growing. Attorneys say that they, the numbers of residents suing 
could reach into the thousands. Uh, so that's what this community is facing in the days, weeks ahead. And again, the bottom line is they are hoping that the nation and everyone else keeps its attention here because they're very concerned about being forgotten. Now back to you. Thanks, Ron. And next, my favorite kind of story in life is the kind that reminds us that we are nowhere near as close to as smart as we think we are. And oh boy, does this next one do exactly that. You know that golden telescope we humans built uh, that's taking some mind-blowing pictures of space right now? Well, it turns out it's so powerful, it might have just shattered our understanding of the universe. We've all heard about how the new James Webb Telescope is kind of like a time machine because it can look back to the early formation of the universe. And it's been doing just that. It has taken pictures of six galaxies that are some of the oldest that we've seen, but they're a little hazy and there's a lot going on in these images. Bear with us. Uh, for one, when you're looking at these things, they're supposed to be from the beginning of time as we know it, and they're not supposed to be all that well formed. Well, guess what? These are looking a lot bigger and a lot more developed than we thought. And why does that matter? Well, for one thing, it could pretty much rewrite a whole bunch of astrophysics textbooks. So, of course, we called up the legendary theoretical physicist Michio Kaku. He's the futurist who always has me dreaming of the cosmos and the author of a bunch of books that might need to be tweaked now if it turns out that the universe is, is older than we think. Hey, Professor, uh, I'm thinking of some of my favorites, the God Equation, Physics of the Future, Future of Humanity. Most of them say the universe is about 13 billion years old. What if it's not? Well, that's the problem. The James Webb Space Telescope is upsetting the apple cart. All of a sudden, we realize that we may have to rewrite all the textbooks about the beginning of the universe. Now, it takes many billions of years to create a galaxy, like the Milky Way galaxy, with 100 billion stars, many billions of years old. But the James Webb Telescope has identified six galaxies that exist half a billion years after the Big Bang that are up to 10 times bigger than the Milky Way galaxy. That shouldn't happen. There should not be primordial galaxies that are bigger than the Milky Way galaxy that are only half a billion years old. Something is wrong. We may have to revise our theory of the creation of the universe. And so we're possibly looking at a universe that's much older than we think it is, and we're also possibly looking at maybe this is an optical illusion? Is that Are those the two options here? That's right. Some people say it's an optical illusion. You see, according to Einstein, gravity can act like glass. The glass, of course, you can make a magnifying glass. With gravity, you too can bend space and time to create a gravity microwave, I mean a magnifying lens, so you think that these galaxies are huge when they're actually baby galaxies. Now, I personally think that the solution to the problem is these are not baby galaxies at all. They're actually monstrous black holes, black holes that formed after the instant of creation that's baffling scientists because they don't fit in the normal sequence of the birth of a galaxy. So I personally think that we're actually looking at monster black holes where perhaps new laws of physics are emerging. And again, if you can figure all this out, there could be a Nobel Prize waiting for you. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you're saying that these galaxies, these six galaxies that look kind of like galaxies are, are actually black holes? Yeah, that's one theory, because we think that at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, there is a, a raging black hole that is two to three million times more massive than our sun. In fact, we now believe that at the center of almost every galaxy in the universe, there's a monstrous black hole that could be millions to billions of times more massive than our own sun. Uh, if that's the case, then you're going to have to rewrite all of your books. And I think I have two of them with your signature on them. So I'm going to need you to re-sign uh, and send me some new ones when you update those. Uh, <laughs> Professor, since we have you, I'd also love to ask you about this discovery a lot closer to us here on Earth. Um, it's another thing that I think you know a lot more about. Apparently, we just discovered that there's a, a fifth layer of our planet deep inside of Earth's core. What kind of knowledge do you think that could potentially unlock? Well, you know, when you see the tragedy in Turkey and Syria, you ask yourself a simple question. 
why don't we know what's underneath our feet? We've been to the moon, we've been to Mars, our probes have gone past Jupiter. How come we don't know what's at the center of the Earth? Well, here is a clue. Think of a sonogram. A sonogram shoots vibrations into the womb of a pregnant woman. The vibrations then create echoes that can be analyzed to create a picture of the unborn child. Well, we can now think about sonogramming the Earth. An earthquake generates all sorts of vibrations that echo, ricochet inside the Earth, allowing us to recreate an image of the center of the Earth. And we find some enormously interesting things. We find, for example, that the core of the Earth spins, but the crust of the Earth can spin in the opposite direction. So these layers underneath our own feet can actually rotate in opposite directions. And we used to think they were four layers, like the, the crust and the mantle, four layers inside the Earth. Recently, we picked up evidence of a fifth, a fifth layer at the very center of the Earth. So we're now basically sonogramming the Earth. And maybe, just maybe one day, we'll be able to use artificial intelligence and supercomputers to tease apart these echoes so that we can get earthquake prediction. We're not there yet, but think about it. We could save the lives of thousands of people if we could somehow take these echoes, run them through a computer, create a map of the inside of the earth, and predict when the next earthquake would hit. I think the people of California would really like that yeah. day oh, when we can do absolutely. earthquake prediction. I, I'm, I'm sitting here in LA and, and thinking of exactly that. It sounds like you're saying that we take earthquakes that are happening right now, almost use them like ultrasounds, and all we need to do is to just have the technology to capture the image from that ultrasound to really know what's in the earth and how to predict earthquakes in the future. Is that right? That's right. And these echoes, these echoes of earthquake vibrations, we used to think they were nonsense. They're so complicated. But with supercomputers and artificial intelligence, one day I think we'll decipher all these echoes and be able to uh, calculate the tension on the San Andreas Fault and many of the other fault lines and get earthquake prediction. It's not out of the question. We can't do it yet. But I think with supercomputers and artificial intelligence, we may be able to decipher the echoes inside the Earth, giving us a snapshot, a sonogram of the Earth itself. Oh, Professor, always a pleasure to, to speak with you. I know you have a lot of work rewriting some of your amazing books uh, as we speak. Thanks so very much for joining us. My pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> And this year, a handful of women are making major history in the ballet world, taking the reins of some of the biggest dance companies in America. Our team sat down with one of them to learn more. Don't uh, go off. He takes you off. So you're on balance, and he, so yeah, he's yeah, in yeah. control. Okay. Yeah. My name is Susan Jaffe, and I am the new artistic director of American Ballet Theater. For 22 years, she graced the stages of American Ballet Theater. As a renowned ballerina, Suzanne Jaffe was often seen with Mikhail Baryshnikov by her side, but her talents go far beyond the powerful stage presence she's remembered for. People would say to me, you know, you'd be a really good artistic director. At the time, I was insulted because I thought, well, why aren't you looking at me as a dancer? I didn't realize at the time that it was supposed to be a compliment. It was a leadership quality. Now, as the new leader of one of the world's most prominent dance companies, it's a homecoming of sorts to be back where she started. It's just such a good elixir for my heart and soul to be back home. The news of Jaffe's appointment quickly sent a buzz through the dance world, partly because the announcement came alongside a few other major leadership changes, like Tamara Rojo taking over the San Francisco Ballet. What's ballet going to look like in 10 years? It's going to be really different because of these women. This feels like a watershed moment. With an average tenure of 13 years, artistic director openings don't come often. One of the things I think people outside of ballet are most surprised to learn is how few ballet companies are run by women. Journalist Chloe Angel is the author of Turning Point, how a new generation of dancers is saving ballet from itself. This is a highly feminized art form that is, by and large, 
run by men. According to Dance Data Project, of the top 50 ballet companies in the U.S., only 30% have female artistic directors. If you want to make a generalization, the bigger the company, the less likely a woman is to be running it. The smaller the company with the smaller budget, the more likely a woman will be running it. It is so identified as a female art form that it's not taken as seriously. The way I like to think about ballet is that when it comes to gender roles, it's like the real world turned up to 11. Ballet is a hundreds of years old tradition built on hierarchy and rigid obedience to authority. Young girls don't see themselves as the boss one day because they're not seeing a boss around them who's a woman. Now, Susan Jaffe is that exception. I'm lucky to be in this time because the only way to, to work through things is to work through things. I love the classics, I love the dramatic works, and I love new and innovative works. And for the few opportunities that we get each year, I'm going to try to increase our diversity of voices, increase opportunities for women, and, and really bring us into our future. And before we go, throughout the war in Ukraine, we've seen little pockets of kindness, joy, and compassion. We're gonna introduce you to musicians who are now constantly receiving standing ovations. And finally tonight, we want to take a moment to listen to some of the sounds coming out of Ukraine that cannot be contained one year into the war there. The culture and strength of Ukrainians appears stronger than ever, and the musicians there seem to be tapping into a resilience that has to be heard to be fully understood. And audiences everywhere are taking notice. NBC's Joe Fryer has that powerful story. These are the civilized sounds one would expect to hear in a revered venue like Carnegie Hall. Harmonious music performed by the Lviv National Philharmonic Orchestra. Yet a much more raucous sound sometimes seems to erupt as these Ukrainian musicians tour America. You walk on the stage in Miami, the orchestra, even before the conductor shows any signs of life, the orchestra walks out and you'd think it's, it's a tie score with five seconds left in the Super Bowl. The public is stamping their feet, they're screaming. Many of them have small Ukrainian flags in their pockets and they're not Ukrainians. They're normal American concert goers. You know, that never happened to me before when you go on stage and there is a standing ovation already. And I kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable in a way because this is not for me. That response is for the orchestra, but it's not about the orchestra. What it's about is their homeland. Just ask Ukrainian-born pianist Stanislav Krestenko, who has family fighting in the war. Those are the heroes, and I'm getting a standing ovation. I don't think this is fair, but I kind of dedicate all this because we all understand who are the real heroes today. The orchestra's tour was actually planned two years ago, well before anyone could have imagined a war in Europe. Their Ukrainian-American conductor, Theodore Kuchar, says 66 musicians are here, but they're preoccupied with what's happening to the loved ones they've left behind. There's nobody here who is not intimately familiar with somebody who has been impacted in the worst possible way by this. So people are highly distracted by what's happening, but they realize also that their existence in the United States, in Carnegie Hall this evening, somebody has put them on a very special mission, and I think they are serving their country as they are best able to right now. What is that mission? The mission, I think, is to show Americans that the country that they are supporting. It's not a band of poor, soulless people. It is intellectually, culturally equal to any of its European counterparts. A mission to share Ukraine's culture with the world, eclipsing images of war with sounds of harmony. This is a historic moment for all Ukrainians. I'm not sure that every musician realizes it, but I think in 20 or 30 years, when they're sitting and reflecting on their careers, where they've been, what they've done, there's no question that this evening will represent the culmination of what Ukrainian musical life has achieved up until this point. 
And that does it for us. I'm Gotti Schwartz for now tonight. We leave you with tributes for Ukraine from around the world one year into their invasion. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.